Too Long Didn't Read, the weekly podcast from the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Hello and welcome to Too Long Didn't Read, news about artificial intelligence articulated intelligently, for the most part. My name's Jonah and I'm a content producer here at the Turing, and with me once again is our very own supercomputer, designed by hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings who wanted to know the answer to life, the universe and everything. I highly doubt my parents would consider themselves hyperdimensional beings or however you describe them. And based <laughs> on my conversations, let's just say only now they're starting to take me seriously. <laughs> but yes, Namaskara, my name is Mera Jaydeva. I'm a research assistant in data justice and global ethical futures here at the Alan Turing Institute. This is episode number seven, Smara. Lucky number seven. Yeah, seven weeks. If this were a baby... It would be 10 millimetres long embryo with a big forehead and little bits of cartilage as arms. <laughs> OK, we better mention the unavoidable drama that we've all been watching this week, where well-known people are living in an isolated echo chamber, arguing with each other and eating cow teat pizzas. That's right. I'm a CEO. Get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, was fired at the end of last week. Then the CTO was pushed into being CEO before bouncing. So the former Twitch CEO stepped in at OpenAI. Then on Sunday, Microsoft, a key investor in OpenAI, announced they would hire Mr. Altman. Then, as the staff of OpenAI began to revolt, it looked likely on Monday that they would all be heading to Microsoft too. But then, by Tuesday, OpenAI had reinstated Sam Altman as CEO. So, the news then there is a man was a CEO and now he still is. <laughs> I should also mention for liable reasons that as far as I know, Sam Altman has not eaten cow teat pizza. But if you've been watching I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, you'll know someone has. Ooh. Smera, it's easy to get caught up in the names and faces behind these tech behemoths and the stories that the press lay on for us. But can you give us some of that special Smera sauce? There always seems to be some drama playing out at these big tech firms. Can you explain a bit more about the broader situation and a little less about the celebs? I can try to. I feel like this is some good tea for those who are interested in it. But going beyond the gossip and potential theories on things that have happened. It's important to know that, you know, in the last few months, OpenAI has got everyone's interest with the different models of ChatGPT being released and everyone wanting to speak to Sam Altman about his thoughts on the future regulation and, and whatnot. So with Sam Altman being ousted when he was ousted as the CEO of uh, OpenAI, such a renowned and now infamous company that's been working on AGI and artificial intelligence state of the art right now. It is a cause of concern for financial markets and investors who are worried about the oversight that the board has on the decisions of a CEO and what it might mean for the financial markets and the economic outcomes that might happen from it. Yeah. So the, the news stories suggest a lot of the problems at OpenAI arose around the dual business models the company has. Um, it began as a non-profit to benefit humanity as a whole mm -hmm. and then later added a for-profit arm to its model. That's bound to create some problems, isn't it? Is is that a common thing in these tech and AI startups? It is. Uh, to, to be a bit more detailed on that, so OpenAI just started off with a goal of 1 billion in donations for building AGI or Artificial General Intelligence for Humanity that is on their website itself. But building AGI, whatever, however they choose to define it, is a very spenny aspect. And it requires a lot more money than the one billion in donations that they were looking at. So then they began a for-profit arm, which they curiously called a capped for-profit model. So this would mean that their board is not explicitly accountable to their shareholders or their investors, including Microsoft, who owns 49% of the shares. That's a lot. Yeah, 49% of the shares. Wow. Yeah. So you have a board that's focused on humanity, but shareholders who are focused on interests, on financial interests, and these are fundamentally at odds with each other. Yeah. A huge element of this understanding is this movement of effective altruism that's now being seen in tech startups across the world, especially in the United States. Okay, uh, sorry, what is effective altruism? Effective altruism was a philosophy that began with Peter Singer and the idea that, you know, if you're going to donate money, let it be useful and let it, and there was this utilitarian angle to it where when you're, when you're using that money for humanitarian aid, 
trade, let it go well, instead of just giving money to people, think about using that money to buy mosquito nets and then send it out to all of those those um, those affected by, say, diseases like malaria. But in tech, it's interesting because these startups are looking at a term called long term, and this is legitimately called long termism, and the future of humanity through their products, like their supposed AGI products, as opposed to near-termism, which attempts to solve contemporary problems of poverty, diseases like malaria and so on. And this entire movement in tech has been also supported by characters like Elon Musk and Sam Bankman-Fried, who was a crypto billionaire who was recently convicted guilty of defrauding the investors who had invested in his cryptocurrency exchange. And the reason why this is important is because people like him believe that raising this kind of wealth and money would create a new future where the money that was raised through these um, through these tech startups and and so on and so forth would actually be used for the betterment of humanity, but more in, in cases like space exploration and the threat of artificial general intelligence or, you know, even a completely different banking sector such as cryptocurrency. But of course, this all failed miserably and it points towards a larger problem within effective altruism itself. So the money they're raising is primarily for future threats, threats that you've mentioned in earlier episodes that maybe shouldn't be the focus. Is is it a bit of a distraction technique or could you argue that it's a bit of a distraction technique? Yeah, one of the big problems that academics and practitioners find with effective altruism is that it supports the current markets of capitalism and the free market model. And they use that to determine where aid and funds should be diverted. The issue with the current economic models that we have are those models are exactly what's contributing to some of these humanitarian issues, be it the private equity stakes in arms and munitions or the stakes in mining, which destroys the environment or even the general culture or this this general hustle culture, nepotism, which encourages getting rich no matter what the cost is. So it, it, it's a weird dichotomy that you're facing where you have a movement that's trying to do good for the world, but it, it's stemming from the same core, which is actually causing those problems. So it, it, yeah. it seems almost at odds with each other. Yeah. Until the baseline structure changes, it's going to make everything above it difficult to yeah, be effective. Yeah. So yeah. You, can't, you, you can't use the same weapon that's harming people to actually save them again. Again, like mm. it, it doesn't seem sustainable at all. Yeah, yeah. So I reckon most of us would agree that the main goal for AI should be benefiting humanity as a whole. Um, why isn't there a sort of multi-agency collaboration like how the ISS is used or CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research? Is that something we could hope for in the future? So there has been a push for building a CERN for AI type international model, but there are so many problems with the CERN model itself. It primarily comprises scientists from mostly the transatlantic, Europe, America, and so on. It's technically for science in the setup, and they have achieved a lot, don't get me wrong. But AI development is weirdly completely different from the particle accelerators that we see in um, in CERN. Mm. So to, to explain this a bit more, you, you and I or other users can get an API or an application program interface or a downloadable version of a generative AI model to develop or fine tune our own models right. for our own users. But before going into these downstream applications, these big tech companies are the ones that essentially hold all of this infrastructure and are able to develop those models in the first place because the, they are incredibly rich. They're richer than so many countries around the world and they're probably the only ones with the resources resources and finances to even develop those kind of AI tools in the first place. And then we reach a point where we're renting their model or what's called rentiership models and the issues that come with that. And and a CERN for AI is also not going to be able to compete in a market where such big tech companies work. There's so much money to be made quickly. So, you know, with, with enough lobbying, governments don't necessarily have to join a global coalition. Instead, they can support causes where AI or big tech can save the economy and its people. Right. Right. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the um, alternative to a to a sort of global collaboration in AI, would that be open source materials? Would, would that be a positive answer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. An open source model is a great example of, of 
that a lot of people are working towards, like Joshua Bengio, have argued for open source models because the development of this tech and the development of the science should be for everyone. It shouldn't be for certain groups of people who can who can, who stand to make a lot of money from it. Yeah. But these kind of open source models can be used for everyone for their own personal uses or, you know, for, for a bunch of people, basically properly democratizing it rather than, you know, saying it's demo- democratic, but really what we're doing is paying a fee regularly in order to use their services. Yeah. And it keeps us within that model that that has like this vicious cycle going round and round. Right. Where we're giving them more money to do what they were doing. So is it possible to build an AI company that advances the state of the art while also truly prioritizing ethics and safety? Uh, that's, that's a hard <laughs> one because, I mean, the financing that you need for computation, software, hardware and, and so forth can only come from like certain forms of investments and private equity and VCs are a huge part of it. And they're the only ones that have the, that kind of money to invest in these in these developments. So you can see why ethics might not be on the priority list. Yeah. Another positive ending to a chapter there. <laughs> I mean, we could try we could try to encourage that, you know, we you know, having spaces like the Alan Turing Institute itself that's working. We don't develop models, but ha- you know, trying to ensure that ethics can be built into those systems and arguing for these better governance approaches is a huge thing. And there are other such in- research institutes across the world and within the UK that are working towards better governance and in use. That's better. Thanks. <laughs> As you, dear listener, may or may not know, the Alan Turing Institute has its main offices in the British Library in London. So we were saddened to learn that our flatmates, or landlords really, were recently the victims of a cyber attack. The attack happened at the end of October, but this week a ransomware group called Ricida have claimed responsibility and have announced what information they have taken, which includes passport details, and that they will sell that data on in an online auction. Smera. It's scary when this happens so close to home, but I suppose it's a sobering reminder of the risks that cyber attacks present. It is. Um, so in the recent years, you know, the conversation on AI has replaced the debates around cyber warfare, at least in my opinion, and the conversations that I've been um, I've been listening into. But but you are right. Cyber attacks are co- are still commonplace and are still a threat that we should be aware of. They can happen anytime, anywhere, to anyone. And with more data being fed into data and set intensive technology, be it Internet of Things infrastructure or AI, it can be lucrative for many groups to hold that data hostage or access sen- sensitive and confidential information from, you know, a lot of people. And I suppose it's important to distinguish the difference between criminal groups extorting money and the groups who act politically to weaken or damage a country or a political figure or something. Yes, there is. Um, so the key difference between cyber criminals and cyber terrorism is that cyber crime is primarily financially motivated, but cyber terrorism usually is driven by a political motive to, um, with a general terrestrial political cause associated with it. And there is a lot of overlap between cyber crime and cyber terrorism in terms of the, the methods of raising funding and whatnot. Yeah. So what have been some of the most effective cyber attacks and how long have cyber attacks been going on? There have been a lot over the last few years and they've been increasing over time. I mean, from when we've started using um, computers, there have been instances of viruses and whatnot being being deployed to cause damage. One of the first biggest ones was what took place in Estonia in 2007, where a DDoS attack or a distributed denial of service attack brought the entire Estonian economy and infrastructure to a standstill. This is the kind of attack that overwhelms the traffic on a server or a network such that people can't access it, Um, which, of course, when it affects aspects like banks, police, government offices, it's a big cause of concern. There have been many theories and hypotheses on who might have been involved. Some suggest it might have been the Russian state or Russian supporters who are involved in it. Uh, because there was a potential trigger event in the weeks prior where there was a removal of a Soviet-era statue, which the Russian minority in Estonia saw as a liberator, but the Estonian majority see as an oppressor from their time being governed under the Soviet uh, government. And they were moving it to a 
graveyard rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. getting rid of it, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. So they're moving it to a graveyard and that, you know, it caused, it's, it caused a lot of issues. And and we'll see that in, in a lot of cases of cyber attacks that these terrestrial geopolitical issues tend to spill over into the cyberspace. And it's now a new arena to fight your wars and to, yeah. um, you know, raise political movements uh, using the tools that we have available. Yeah, and it's an incredibly effective arena to fight those wars. Yeah, and, and then we have the famous war uh, Wanna cry or wanna cryptor attacks, which brought the entire NHS to a standstill in 2017. The ransomware or ransom worm was first identified in South Asia, then in South America, and eventually Europe. And this all happened over the course of an entire morning to an afternoon. And this was the first instance of such a powerful ransomware. So, what is ransomware? Ransomware essentially encrypts your files and data and, you know, as the name suggests, holds it ransom until a payment has been made to, in order to release the, the files and data. Does it um, have an interface? So would you know if you've got ransomware? Yes, you would. Usually there's a, there'll be like an alert email or an alert message shown on your computer that your files have been locked or your entire right. system has been locked and you need to pay this money to this, um, you know, this entity. And it's usually cryptocurrency that's used in it. Um but and also, presumably worth noting that you can get those emails and they mean nothing. They don't have your data. Yeah, yeah. That's also a big issue because sometimes it ca that can be the start of a new ransomware yeah. attack where they send this phishing email that looks so suspicious and then you have a fear that, oh, they have access to Yeah, I feel like that's the kind of one that like, I'm sure my parents have fallen awry mm -hmm. to, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we can we can get to like methods of, of how to be a bit more aware of it, you know, towards yeah. towards the end. So a ransomware can secretly infect a computer or host without being actively executed. Usually when you open a phishing email with malware, clicking on a SAS link will read it, to, will release the malware. But WannaCry carried all of this out without active engagement from a user. And, you know, this is where it actually oh, really? gets interesting. Yeah. Shadow Brokers, a secret hacking group, released information on a fault in the Microsoft operating systems, the, the operating systems that led to WannaCry being spread. So the, the issue with that operating system or the zero day was that there was a path that the malware could take to, in order to infect the system without active engagement from the user, like say... So you didn't have link. to click something. Yeah, you didn't have to. And this was something okay. that was that was already a fault essentially with the Microsoft operating systems. And it, what's interesting is shadow brokers actually took this information from the NSA or the US security wing. They'd already identified this issue in Microsoft and it was part of their own hacking toolkit. So they were aware that this patch was there and they were using it in order for, for their own hacking operations, right? And this is NSA's sort of hacking operations for security rather than nefarious purposes. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. We had a government agency that was aware about this information, but uh, essentially those patches were not released in order for people to update their software systems and protect against such an attack. So they kind of shot themselves in the foot there. Yeah. It sounds like a plot to a film. How did it come to an end? So they included a kill switch and a kill switch is usually something that can turn off the, essentially turn off the malware or any kind of attack like this, right? And Usually you wouldn't want to include a kill switch because you want to break down as much of the system as possible. But some theorize that the kill switch was included because an earlier ransomware attack called Conficker brought a lot of undue attention and they didn't want some of this attention. And the kill switch was, was discovered by your own countryman, a man named Marcus Hitchens, who discovered that affected computers would try would often try to access a website that was unregistered. And he basically bought the 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 domain um for that website and he brought an end to it that's that's basically oh. how he stopped it go marcus <laughs> so cyber warfare is massively damaging and really difficult to stop is it considered a weapon in warfare terms it, it seems like an incredibly powerful weapon it could be a very powerful weapon. And again, like I said before, this is where terrestrial geopolitics spills into the cyberspace. And one of the most controversial um, attacks that have taken place was on the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran. Uh, you know, we all know the, the debate around Iran's nuclear program and the concerns and the different camps of interest. But what's interesting for this story is the Stuxnet malware that was used. It had been released through a USB stick that was plugged into the computer. So within the Natanz nuclear facility, there was an air gap between the, the computers and the actual centrifuges so that any attack on the computers would not be able to like, at least the idea was that any issue with the computer side would not affect the centrifuges, right? 
Okay. But what but what's interesting about this Stuxnet malware is that it actually started traveling through the entirety of the Microsoft system until it hit the specific Siemens industrial control system, which controlled and monitored the functioning of the nuclear centrifuges. And so it had to lay dormant and unidentified until it managed to reach wow. that industrial control system. And it doesn't even stop there. It, it was so sophisticated that it, it would only slowly cause damage to the yeah. physical system. Say it would affect the activity of the centrifuges, but the, the computers monitoring that would show that everything is normal and it would do this regularly on a periodic basis until it did it to a point that it caused severe damage to the physical infrastructure of that nuclear facility. And Blimey. Yeah, so and and to have that level of sophistication. It's really subtle, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that level of sophistication and um, capability to build such a tool could not, uh, at least some theorize, could not have come from a non-state group or just a random group of hackers. They believe that it might have been either a state supporting group or an advanced persistent threat group, which is what it's usually called, or, you know, a state itself that's developed it. So many newspapers even reported the hand of the Israeli intelligence wings in possibly developing this tool. Some researchers at Kaspersky noted that a similar worm was part of the equation group toolkit, the same NSA group that I mentioned in the Warner Cry story. And right. they suggest that the similarities between the two mean there might be an association between the actors, but this is where it gets a bit tenuous. We can never be sure. It's very yeah. hard to actually pinpoint who might have been the the aggressor in this instant and who might yeah. have actually developed this tool. That's one of the hardest issues. So there's no like ballistics to analyze, I suppose, or there's less ballistics to analyze yeah, than a physical yeah. bullet. The ballistics yeah. is the damage that it caused and how it was released, which is what Kaspersky researchers use to actually identify some of the similarities. But it's, yeah. it's not it's not as easy. Yeah. So here at the Turing, we have a number of defense and security research programs. Um, data science and AI can help better analyze massive amounts of data to find key intelligences in it to make better, more informed decisions. Mm -hmm. With all these bright minds working on these problems, as well as other national institutes and agencies, are we heading towards being protected from cyber attacks? So what are governments doing to keep society safe? Yeah, um, I, as I mentioned before, you know, it, because of that anonymity on the internet and the anonymity in the cyberspace, it's very hard mm. to pinpoint the criminal, be it a state or a non-state actor. So cyber warfare as a field is is very, very tenuous. Um, it's hard to lay down, and warfare in particular, because it's hard to lay down the rules of the war if we don't know which armies are fighting in it. Um, for instance, after the, the Estonia attacks, what Estonian the Estonian government did was actually start looking very, very seriously into its government infrastructure and the amount of governance of this as well and start like building up uh, their own population to better respond to such threats because they never want to be left that vulnerable, especially yeah. with the countries. Yeah, so they sort of had a head start yeah, in a way. So, so especially the countries that they border and with the events that took place there led to the development of the NATO's um, uh, cybersecurity center of excellence that that now produces a lot of the research on, on cyber attacks and cyber groups operating. One huge element of this is the academic work that was released called the Talent Manuals uh, 1.0 and 2.0, and they what they try what well, it is an academic work. It's not a binding document, but what it attempts to do right. is try to see if international law can be applied to cyber warfare. But there are so many issues with it. In traditional warfare, there are combatants, armies, or groups, and we're aware of it. And there is also physical infrastructure that's involved. But and in order to make sure that you know, war is carried out as much as it can be in a humanitarian and like justifiable way. Yeah. Yeah. You have the principles of humanitarian law. And they specify just in Bayo and just at Bellum. So just in Bayo is the methods of warfare. So how the war is actually going to be fought. And in, okay. in that, it, it specifies that there should be proportional response. It shouldn't affect civilians. Um, aid agencies like healthcare systems should not be affected. And of course, may, this has not been adhered to in many instances of warfare around mm. the world. And yeah. on the other hand, there's the just ad bellum principle, which stipulates the grounds for war itself. And this is very important for countries like the UK, which are part of the, you know, they're part of the NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And Article 5 of the NATO Charter or the Atlantic Charter specified that states that an attack against one will result in a collective response of everyone against the attacker. 
Yeah. Which would make sense if it was a terrestrial war, say country A, you know, bombs yeah, Turkey yeah. or Rome- or uh, Greece, you know, you know who who's do you know country A is responsible so you have to re- you will all collectively engage in warfare against them. But if it's in the cyberspace, we don't really know. Attribution is so hard that we don't know who it is. We can have theories about it, but those theories are not sufficient. And even if those theories are sufficient, having something like the like collective se- collective self defense could be a problem that a lot of people you know it, it, it changes the grounds for warfare and it's like it, this isn't sufficient evidence for us to actually get into war with them and engage you know militarily mm. with with combat so it's almost a safer way for um an enemy of yeah. somewhere to begin yeah. some subtle attacks yeah. which are actually really damaging yeah. but have less ramifications and say even in the case that cyber warfare does is conducted would that then mean that cyber weapons are allowed? And the Talon manuals are like uh, also. Did. So the Talon manuals also try to get into what, whether civilian data should receive the same protection as civilian objects. So if you're a civilian, you should be you shouldn't be shot. Civilian areas should not come under threat. But our data is is that data also similar to yeah, our physical weaponized. infrastructure? So there are all of these questions, which is why cyber warfare has always been a tenuous subject, and it it seems unlikely that they're ever going to have have ratifying laws about it because of how, you know, amorphous this entire yeah. space is. And the ethics of defence and security must be even trickier ground to tread than usual AI <laughs> ethics. So as well as the government, what can you and I do to keep ourselves safe? We need a lot more digital literacy and training against these threats. I've explained how Estonia did it and made made sure that the prob their population has such a robust understanding of information technology to protect themselves and be aware of of the threats that might arise. But, you know, you and I, my, our parents and so many people might not be aware of a phishing email when they see it. And AI is already being used to make phishing emails even more convincing. So we need that digital literacy as the first um, line of defense against this. So we're aware that something suspicious, this does not look right. I sh- probably should not be clicking on this link. Also, alongside that, but the amount of technology that we use and systems that we use, we should ensure that we routine, routinely update our software. And from a company standpoint, those protections and patches should be regularly released so that these zero days of vulnerabilities are not exposed and can so that they're not taken ad- advantage of. So, um, as always, we'll put the um, links to any resources and sources in the show notes, and we'll also include um, some online media literacy resources that the UK government have put out to help those who feel like they might need help. And so working on um, our private data is obviously a sensitive topic, but for these agencies to be effective with their research, transparency isn't always going to be possible, right? I mean, public trust is a huge part of this entire landscape. And if these institutions are working with the interests of everyone involved and ensuring that public trust is always there in, in the work that they do. Yeah. I suppose that's the importance of having places like the Turing and other national institutes that represent yes. the people. <laughs> Smera, mm. think about a fruit in your head. Are you thinking of a fruit? Yeah. Is it a melon? No, it's not. Oh. <laughs> I first thought banana, then I thought apple, and then I thought orange. So Okay, so I've effectively proved that I cannot read minds. <laughs> However, this week I was reading some brain fizzing articles about using AI to read our minds. I might be using sensationalist language there, but basically neuroscientists at the University of Texas have figured out a way to take fMRI scans, that's functional magnetic resonance imaging, of brain activity and translate it into words using good old chat GPT. Immediately, this suggests a massive leap forward for people who have lost the ability to speak, such as those who have had strokes or motor neuron disease. And it's non-invasive, i.e. no surgery. Yeah. So previously, they use electrodes in the brain to actually monitor brain activity and they have some data from it. But it that does have its own problems with it, physically speaking. So using a non-invasive method could actually help a lot of these people without compromising their physical health and especially their 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 mental capabilities and capacity. So the team, as you mentioned, use F- fMRIs and ChatGPT one. The first the first little ChatGPT model that was released it uses the same um, gentle pre-trained transformer model and uses beam search to further narrow down the the i the potential next word that might come. I mentioned this okay. before that generative language tools. 
essentially create probabilistic ideas of what the next word is going to be. Yeah. But the data for this is the brain activity from the participants. So the procedure that they used in order to train this model and get the results that they did was they worked with a few volunteers divided into a control and non-control group who would learn through listening to audio clips, including podcasts and audiobooks. They would conv- they would essentially convert the brain activity into a string of words and use ChatGPT one as a database for those string of words and beam search to fine tune the the final result. Okay, so another article I read was about how Meta have also developed something similar. Their new AI system can decode visual representations in the brain in almost real time. They put so much effort into the development of the AI that they forgot to name the science bit something suitably catchy, though. Magnetoencephalography. Smira, any help with this? (laughs) Okay, how about we call it Meg for short? Yes, I like that. So the process is done by capturing thousands of instances of brain activity measurements per second. And wow. the AI can develop through this brain activity uh, image representations and generate that image based on the brain's responses. So essentially, the neurons in the algorithm or the neural network is coming closer to the neurons in our brain because yeah. the, the research that Meta has done has found that artificial neurons are now reacting similarly to our brain neurons for that given image. Wow. And so the brain's pinging off and they were able to decode the, what those those pings and that data means in real time. So if I were to show you a picture of a dog yeah. and your your mind was, you know, connected to the the, the headset, you we would get a, a generated image of what is seemingly a dog. Of course, there are some issues with how that dog actually yeah. looks and it probably isn't as good looking as a dog and it it looks a bit funky but yeah basically they managed to do that in real time and they have admitted in their paper that you know there were instances of miscategorization or misclassification so there is a lot more work that needs to be done there okay as usual i think i'm possibly jumping ahead of myself but i'm going to continue to do so (laughs) aside from helping people with communication problems which is incredibly exciting could there one day be a sort of minority report type scenario where these tools could be used to get a truthful answer from a suspected murderer on trial or something like that. Saying it out loud, I can almost hear you talking about (laughs) privacy concerns, algorithmic bias and vulnerable groups. Listen, I'm not the 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 Viscountess of vulnerable <laughs> groups unless I don't speak for my people. All right, there's there's a reason why I do that it's because enough. they're most likely going to be harmed. There are potential positive uses of them using it to help people who have lost the b- ability to communicate, like you and I. But this, in the first instance, and I feel it's very important to say that we should also be mindful that for a lot of disabled people, they don't really want to use tools to sound like what you and I sound like. They're very happy to be speaking as as the way that they do. Yeah. And unless you are in conversation, you often tend to lose out on those kind of insights. Not everyone wants to sound the same. And there is that uniqueness in the way that everyone speaks. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. on to... On to, you know, the minority report type scenarios. Yeah. And I think this was also a Black Mirror episode. I think it was called Crocodile. Um, essentially, a woman runs over a person uh, a few years oh, ago yeah. and someone finds out about it. And then they have like this decoding machine where they ask questions and they try to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so that was also that was also an episode. And. I, I think we're far from that, hopefully, <laughs> because there are laws in place to prevent something like this. So the EU AI Act proposes that to ban systems that manipulate persons through subliminal techniques or exploit the fragility of vulnerable persons and could potentially harm the manipulated individual or a third person. So this, the European Union's EU AI Act is essentially looking into this to prevent that kind of manipulation right. and nudging. But there have been issues with the framing of that itself that, you know, it should also include non-subliminal techniques that materially distort a person's behavior, as well as uh, regulation on experimentation, which in the course of experimentation might alter the person's behavior as well. So some psychologists say that, um, you know, uh, preferences influence behavior and behavior changes preferences. Uh, There's an example of moral licensing where people nudged into pro-social behavior in one context are apparently more likely to behave and Antisocially in another context itself. So Blimey. this nudging already exists. Yeah. 
if it's on an algorithmic scale, it's going to be bad in terms of nudging itself. Yeah. But also that ability to be able to say access that information, be it real or not, is is something of concern. And it feels like more and more we're reaching a point where nothing of us is going to belongs to us anymore, yeah. which is which is not it, it, that doesn't sound very no, nice. No, I would like to retain my brain <laughs> privacy, please. <laughs> Do you want to read the positive news quickly? Jonah, I'm feeling very depressed with this bad weather. It's it's the big sad time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. How about instead you give me this week a piece of positive news from the world of tech and AI? Well, I can try. I did find one this week from The Guardian, I think. Let me just find it. Uh, <laughs> right. Yes, right. <clears throat> Taking up Smara's role here. <laughs> My reason to feel positive is that AI could be used to predict if a person is at risk of having a heart attack up to 10 years in the future. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So the study, funded by the British Heart Foundation and carried out by scientists in Oxford, looked at how AI might improve the accuracy of cardiac CT scans, which are used to detect blockages or narrowing in the arteries. Mm -hmm. The BHF said that about 350,000 people in the UK have a CT scan each year, but many patients later die of heart attacks due to failure in picking up small, as yet undetectable, narrowings. Mm. The team led by Professor Antionades analysed data from 40 thousand patients undergoing routine cardiac CT scans and then the AI tool was tested on a further 3,393 patients over almost eight years and proved to be effective at predicting the risk of a heart attack. Antionades added, we hope that this AI tool will soon be implemented across the NHS, helping prevent thousands of avoidable deaths from heart attacks every year in the UK. That's about all I can muster from my notes. I'm sure there's more details in there. But yeah, there you go. There's a pretty good reason to um, to feel positive. <laughs> I'm out of my depth, as you can probably tell. I think that's great. And I think for a cash-strapped NHS, this would be a great addition. Yeah. So I think that's a great piece of story. Thank you, Jonah, for, for giving me something positive to look forward to in the big sad. My pleasure. Well, I think we'll call it an episode there. Thank you, Smera. And I hope the big sad soon becomes a big happy. <laughs> This week we learned about the complications of being a capitalised non-profit Heard of thought We learned about the covert weapon that is cyber attacks And we learned that although AI will soon be able to dramatically help people with communication problems It is not yet sophisticated enough to read my filthy inner monologue <laughs> That's it. We read so you didn't have to. Not long until the end of this series. Boo. But before that, some special Christmas episodes. Yay! Where we'll be answering listeners' questions among many other lighter biters. So, please ask us some questions. Email podcast at turing.ac.uk And as always, thumbs up, smiley face, like this podcast and share with someone who you think would like a balance of intellect and idiot. Thanks to Jesse, managing our public engagement as only a public engagement manager can. Can, and thank you to you, you wonderful listener. Double wonderful if you made it this far. And even more so if you made it here, right to the very end. Bye. Goodbye from me.